We want to welcome you tonight for our discussion of Acts of the Apostles, chapters 10, 11, and 12. Now, I want to review something in the Catechism at number 53. It's the way God teaches us. It's God's divine pedagogy. God's divine plan of revelation is realized simultaneously through deeds and words, through what he does and what he says, which are intrinsically bound up with each other and shed light on each other. And this involves a specific divine pedagogy. And this is the way God teaches his people. It's God's pedagogy to communicate himself to man gradually. Gradually, God prepares man in stages uh, to welcome his uh, supernatural revelation. And it culminates in one thing, in a person and mission of the incarnate word, Jesus Christ. So this is how God's going to communicate himself to man, gradually in stages over history, a series of covenants with man over time. That's how God teaches. That's his pedagogy. He is a loving, loving, loving father. And he wants us to be his children. He wants everyone in his family. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. And God is a family. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So God is building his family, his forever eternal family, and he wants us to be part of it. And his pedagogy is to communicate himself gradually over time through word and deed, and it's all going to culminate in one thing, Jesus Christ. So a series of covenants over time, and each time he makes a new covenant, God ups the ante a little bit. He broadens the people it's for. What's it mean to up the ante? I looked it up in Webster. To raise the cost. Oh, yeah. He will raise the cost or the risk of an activity to increase the quality of something. These covenants are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. He's going to up the ante every time because God's all in. And he wants us all in. And he wants all in. That means the Assyrians and the Egyptians and the Samaritans and the Americans. He wants us all in and he wants us all in. All our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength for him. So today the Gentiles are coming in. And it will be through the first Gentile believer, Cornelius. God's going to make gradual covenants in salvation history, but they will lead to one thing, Jesus. So let's look at the first one. The first one's just two people in God. It's a marital covenant. It's in Genesis, and it's Adam and Eve. Two people in God. One holy couple that in their human weakness choose not to believe God and they believe the father of lies, Satan. Did God really say that? Really? And Paul knew that when he said they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. We got tarnished. Our futile thinking became darkened. We traded the truth of God, the father of truth. We traded the truth of God who always tells the truth to his children to the lies of Satan, the father of lies. And we believed him instead of God. So they listened to the father of lies instead of the father of truth, and the father of truth came after them. And, and they were hiding, and they were shamed. Immediately they were shamed, and they covered themselves. And God went looking for them, and he said, You guys, I thought we had a covenant. I thought we were in this together. But in his great mercy... God killed the first animal. He shed the first animal blood to cover them, to cover their shame, to clothe them in his mercy, and to cover their shame, to cover their sin with animal blood. And he banished man from the garden in his greatest mercy because if they were in the state of mortal sin and they picked from that tree of eternal life now and ate it and lived forever in the state of eternal separation from God, the greatest mercy God could have done was got them out of there for a while until he could execute the plan and it was the plan all along and the plan has the name Jesus Christ so they learned to sacrifice to the Lord they must have felt horrible they lost communion with God they lost face time with God and they must have wanted to make reparation and he had showed them that he killed an animal to clothe them so they start killing animals to offer him sacrifice 
And they taught their children how to offer sacrifice to the Lord. And Abel's was very pleasing to God because his heart was pure and good. And Cain's was not as pleasing. And we know that they were in a wounded human condition because of sin. And here's the result of it. One brother killing, murdering, the first murder, innocent blood crying out to the ground, from the ground to God. So human nature is severely wounded from listening to the father of lies, Satan. All human nature is wounded. We have a mortal wound. It comes in our DNA. It's called original sin. So when God created, he had created order. He had ordered all the chaos and created. Now humans, by their own choosing, are returning to the chaos because of sin. Internally, they're disordered now. And they have disordered passions. And it's a downward spiral by human choosing. Now, that was a couple, a man and woman. Now God's going to extend it to a household covenant. One holy family now. The Lord saw it, time passed, and the Lord saw the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made humankind on the earth. It grieved him to his heart. Oh, that always gets me that the Lord was sorry he made humankind. So the Lord said, I'll blot out the earth, all the human beings I've created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I made them. And he sends a flood, a great flood. But there is one family, one household. Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. That's the same word, Mary, highly favored one. Noah found favor. God took grace, gave grace unto Noah and his family and made a household covenant with them. And when they landed from the flood, he said, I will establish my covenant with you, Noah. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And when Noah came off that ark with all the animals, first thing he does is offer God a sacrifice of thanks, an animal sacrifice. One of the animals that had made it is sacrificed to give thanks to God. The blood of the animal is shed. It's a new creation. It's a fresh start. We're starting all over again. So there's no more disordered passion, right? It's been wiped out by the floodwaters, right? Wrong. Disordered passion is still there because human nature has been wounded by sin. It's a downward spiral. We are a wounded people. We need a savior. Noah gets drunk, plants a vineyard. First thing, gets drunk. Ham looks on his father's nakedness. We know from our study in Genesis, that's a Hebrew idiom for incest with the mother while his dad's passed out drunk. Disordered passions are still there, even in a new creation. The flood waters didn't wash away sin. They are not baptismal waters. They're flood waters. But they point to baptismal waters. So now, years and years pass, and God's going to make a tribal covenant. He's, he's, made, he's up in the ante. He's making it bigger. Now it's going to be a tribe. It was a holy couple. Then it was a household. Now it's a tribe. And he calls Abraham from Ur of the Chaldeans and says, Abraham, Abraham, I want to bless you. I want to make a great nation through you. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through your seed. All the families. All the families. So Abraham took Sarai, and they left Ur. And God made a covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15. And he had Abraham get animal carcasses, and he split them. And he took them out to see the stars. And he said, you're going to have children as numerous as the stars. And Abraham says, one problem. I don't have any kids. We can't have kids. But he believed the Lord, and the Lord credited it to him as righteousness. And he got the animals, and he split the carcasses, and he fought them off, the, the birds of prey. And God put him into a deep sleep, into a trance, like what Peter was in today on the rooftop. God put him into a deep sleep with these animals on both sides. And the Lord said, know this for certain, Abraham, that your offspring will be aliens in a land that is not theirs. They will be slaves there, and they shall be oppressed for 400 years. And then the Lord made it be dark, and he sent a smoking, tor a smoking pot and a fire torch through the animal carcasses. And he said, Abraham, to your descendants, I will give this land, even while you sleep. 
And then the final test in Abraham, uh, in the sacrifice of Isaac, when he says, stop, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, Lord, good answer, good answer, stop. I know, I know that you believe me. I know that you are obedient. I know that you have faith. I will indeed bless you, Abraham. You don't have to kill your son. There's a ram in the thicket caught in the thorn bushes. And I will make your offspring numerous as the stars of the heaven and the sand of the seashore. And all nations will be blessed by you because you have listened to my voice. Now there's no more disordered passion. This one's going to work, right? Wrong. Years pass, and God makes now a national covenant. A, a married couple, a household, a tribe, now a nation. God's up in the ante, letting more in to the covenant. I'm going to make a nation. But remember what he said to Abraham. They shall be aliens in a land that is not theirs, and they shall be slaves there, oppressed for 400 years. Well, guess what? 400 years is up. And Moses sees a burning bush that won't be consumed, and he hears the voice of God, and God says, take off your shoes, Moses. You're standing on holy ground. And Moses hid his face. And God made a covenant with Moses. The Lord said, I've observed the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cry. And I'm sending you to bring them out and into a land of milk and honey. So Moses leads God's people out of Egypt, and they emerge through the water of the Red Sea like a baptism, waters of death. They walk right through, and they emerge as a new nation. And now all the waters of the Red Sea baptism have cleansed them from sin, so they have no more disordered passion, right? Right. Now Moses was very humble, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. And God gave him a national covenant on top of Mount Sinai. And God established a priesthood, gave Moses all the plans for the temple, all the, everything, how everything was supposed to work right down to the garment of the priest, everything, so they could offer praise and thanks to the Lord. And he said, I'll even write the Ten Commandments with my own finger, the finger of God. I'll, so the people will know right from wrong. I'll help you, Moses. Now all the disordered passions will be gone, Right? Grumble, 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 40 years of grumbling. Human nature is deeply, 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 deeply wounded by sin. And our passions are disordered, and we're inclined to sin. It's a downward spiral. We have concupiscence. Paul says, I do what I don't want to do, and what I do want to do, I don't do. What is that? That's his wounding. So then Joshua, Yeshua. God saves. It's going to lead them into the promised land. And the river parts, the Jordan River parts, and they go through on dry shot. That's the water of baptism that's going to cleanse them. They're in the promised land now. Everything's going to be great. No, they still have disordered passion. And God's going to up the ante and make it a kingdom covenant. Married couple, household, tribe, nation. Now kingdom. We want a king. We want a king. We want to be like the other nations. Okay, I'll give you a king. King Saul. Ooh, he's not going to be a very good king. <laughs> Okay, I'll replace him with King David, a man after my own heart. And God makes a covenant with David. And he says, I will establish my kingdom. He's going to build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Not through you, David, but through your son, one of your own offspring from your own loin. And David offers sacrifice to the Lord, praise and thanksgiving. King Solomon, David's son from his own body. He's going to have an everlasting, eternal, forever kingdom for the Lord, right? Wrong. He takes 700 princesses, 300 concubines, 1,000 wives turn his heart away from the Lord. He has very much disordered passion, times 1,000. Solomon did not establish the throne of God's forever kingdom. It won't be Solomon. But surely now all the disordered passions are gone. Man's wounded by sin, deeply wounded. Our nature is tarnished. We need a Savior. We need a Savior. We can't do it on our own. God's really going to up the ante now because God wants us all in, all in and all in. And he's all in. So he makes a universal covenant for all, for every single man, woman, child, Gentile, Jew, servant, free. No more. All. All, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Omahans, one holy, Catholic, apostolic church for all. And he said to David, a 
about his son. I will establish a kingdom. He'll build a house for my name. I will establish his throne forever. And then many years later, hear this, what he says to this young girl, this young virgin Jewish girl. Now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and name him Jesus. God saves. He's going to be great. He's going to be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will be no end. This is it. This is it. This is the offspring from 315 Genesis that we've been waiting for. This is the seed. This is it. This is the one that can bring the universal covenant, the one holy church for all mankind. This is King Jesus. He will have an eternal, forever kingdom that will not end. He will be called great, the son of the most high God. And there he is. This is his kingdom. This is his glory. This is the hour. It's a different ram. It's a lamb caught in a thicket. Abraham, this is the lamb I told you about, that God would provide the lamb. This is the lamb, Abraham. He's caught in a thicket of thorns. And Moses, this is the Passover lamb that I told you about, that I had you to, you kill every year to remember, to never forget. This is the lamb, Moses. This is the Passover lamb. This is Jesus, the lamb of God for all, who takes away the sin of the world for all. This is the one. This is the Lamb of God. Happy are those who are called to his supper and everyone's called and everyone's invited to the supper of the Lamb. Everyone. Now. Now. Does it mean that all our disordered passions are gone now? <laughs> no! We're wounded. We're deeply broken. We believe the father of lies. We have disordered passions. God communicates himself gradually to man. We couldn't take it all at once. This has taken thousands of years for him to reveal his plan to us, his mystery, his saving mystery of grace. He keeps upping the ante. Bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger till it's for all, 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 all. The floodwaters did not wash away our sin. They're not baptismal waters. The Red Sea waters did not wash away our sin. They're not baptismal waters. The Jordan River did not wash away our sins. They're not baptismal waters, but they all point to, they're all a typology of, how about the baptismal waters of John the Baptist in the Jordan River? Did those do it? That was a baptism of repentance. The Pharisees came out to see what was going on. They said, why are you baptizing? Are you the Messiah or the Elijah or the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water. Water, just water. But among you stands one whom you do not know. But the one who's coming after me, I'm not even worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. And when he saw him coming the next day, he said, there he is, there, he, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he's the one, he's the one, he, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Oh, there's a Holy Spirit. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit, Jesus said to Nicodemus. Oh. And all the synoptics said in Jesus' own words, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And today's gospel, I've come to bring fire on the earth. And oh, how I wish it was already blazing. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We didn't know there were three of them. We just knew God the Father. The Jews just knew God the Father. They didn't know he had a son. They didn't know there was a Holy Spirit that could indwell human beings. And the, pre and the bishop at, at Basile 
Be sealed. He puts an indelible seal on your forehead. Be sealed with the Holy Spirit. Because this is a loving Father who wants us in full communion with his complete self. And he's a trinity of persons. And he's a family in himself. He and the Son have a perfect love. And the perfection of their love is the Holy Spirit. And he wants to fill us with that perfection of love. He's a communion of three persons, and he wants us to be his children. We are his children. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called his children. He's building a family, a forever family, an eternal family, and it's for all. And like a good father, he provides food for us. In a new covenant, eat my bread, drink my blood. And we remember time and time and time again around the clock perpetually the sacrifice somewhere around the world the sacrifice of the mass is going on it's his sacrifice once for all but we remember perpetually what he did for us and we thank him it's a celebration of thanksgiving eucharist thanksgiving to god we're perpetually thanking him over and over and over as we remember this sacrifice Hebrews 13, verse 15, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. And that's what we do. Surely now, all disordered passions are gone. No, we're still wounded. We're still broken. We need a Savior to save us from ourselves, to save us from the powers of death, to save us from the power of sin in our own lives. What's our response to Jesus? He did this for all, but how do we respond back to him? That's what matters. That's what matters. Is he the king of your life? Is he the Lord of your life? Is he the one who sits on the throne of your heart? Is he the one you serve? Do we live by his spirit? Do we walk with his spirit? Because we have power now, dynamis inside of us. Now we can redirect our passions if we live in the Spirit. Paul tells us that, that the works of the flesh, anything fleshly, anything that pleasures our flesh, is going to lead to death. The wages of sin is death. Live by the Spirit, I say. Do not gratify the desires of the flesh. In contrast, Live by the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You can control yourself in the Spirit. You can master your sin in the Spirit with the help of the Spirit living in Christ. And those who have belonged to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit... Let us also be guided by the Spirit. We have power in us. And when we fall, we have confession. He even made that provision through the sacraments. We can eat Jesus. He, we can internalize him. And when we fall, when we live by the flesh instead of the Spirit, we can go to confession and hear a priest in persona Christi say, your sins are forgiven you. Go in peace now and love and serve the Lord. God super, 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 super up the ante and made every provision we need as a loving father for his children. He wants us all in, and he wants us all in. Now, Cornelius, the centurion of the Italian cohort, not a Jew. They hate the Romans. Romans are oppressing them. Romans are ruling over them. Why would they like a centurion Roman soldier? He has at least 100 men under him to be a centurion. He's a man of authority. We met other centurions in the scripture. Luke showed us the one, and we say it at Mass. Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Only say the word, and my servant shall be healed. And Jesus said, oh, I haven't seen greater faith than this in all Israel, from none of you Jews, but this Roman centurion. Oh. And at the foot of the cross, a Roman centurion saw what had taken place. He praised God. And he said, certainly this man was innocent. This man was the son of God, like he said. So we have a centurion today, Cornelius. He lives in Caesarea Maritima, a beautiful city that King Herod the Great built. Caesarea Maritima, named in honor of Augustus Caesar, 
the same Augustus Caesar in the Bible at the time of the birth of Christ. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus. And the city of Caesarea was described by detail by Josephus in his history book. And the city soon became a place of the, a seat of the Roman prefect. It was a beautiful port city. And Pilate went there. Pilate ruled from that seat. And we know in 1961, they found the Pilate Stone, which gave proof that Pilate was there, the same Pilate who ordered crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The tablet says, Tiberium Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea. Now, Zacchaeus, that Father talked about tonight, he's only found in Luke chapter 19. And Father told the story, he's up in the tree. But we know from the Apostolic Constitution that Zacchaeus was the first bishop of Caesarea. Cool, huh? The second bishop was named Cornelius. The third bishop was Theophilus. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? Uh, we don't know their last names, but I'm assuming that it's Zacchaeus, Cornelius, and Theophilus, the God lover that Luke addresses both his gospel and Acts of the Apostles to. This was Herod's Harbor, magnificent, beautiful port city. He had an elaborate aqueduct system because that was all salt water from the Mediterranean Sea, and he pumped in water from Mount Carmel. And um, because there was no, just at this elaborate aqueduct, it still stands today. He had a hippodrome there where they could do games. Um, chariot races, wrestling, stuff like that. He had an amphitheater there. It's still there. Um, I visited it, sat in it. Beautiful acoustics. But this is the place where in Acts chapter 12, Herod dies and is eaten by worms in his own amphitheater right here. Josephus writes about it. But it's also in Acts chapter 12. The people kept shouting that Herod had the voice of a god and not of a mortal, and Herod took glory for that. Unlike Peter, who did not. Peter said, I'm a mere mortal. Stand up, Cornelius. But Herod said he liked that adulation, that he was a god. And immediately, because he had not given the glory to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died right in his own amphitheater. Now, in Caesarea was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. And he was a devout man who feared God with all his household. And he gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. Notice the three things he did. He prays constantly and he gives alms. And we know the other part of that is fasting. When you pray, fast, and give alms, that's a perfect trifecta. <laughs> Remember that if, you're, if you have a super big intention on your heart, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. That's what Cornelius did. And one afternoon at 3 o'clock, 3 o'clock, the hour of divine mercy of Jesus Christ, the hour of the evening sacrifice at the temple. Three o'clock, Cornelius had a vision where he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius! And he stared at him in terror and he said, what is the Lord? Good answer, Cornelius. <laughs> and the Lord said, he, God, answered your prayers. And your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Cornelius, God answered your prayers at the 3 o'clock hour. What was his prayer? Because it's been answered. What was he praying for? Because it's been answered. It reminded me of Z Zechariah when he got that chance to go in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, and an angel appeared to him. And Zechariah was terrified, and fear overwhelmed him. And the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. It was at 3 o'clock also. And he said, for your prayer has been heard. What was he praying for? Because <laughs> both of them, your prayer has been heard. He has answered your prayer. Now, if you remember Zechariah, what were they both praying for? If you remember Zechariah, he was praying for the salvation of Israel. Like any good priest that gets the opportunity to go in front of the Holy of Holies, you better be praying for the salvation of Israel. Or you're going to be struck dead by the living God. And he might have even said, and by the way, could Elizabeth have a baby? <laughs> and guess what? The answer is the same. The answer is the same. Your prayer has been heard because, yes, Elizabeth will have a baby that will herald the way of salvation because salvation is coming. The 490 years are up. The 77s are up. Remember that? What was Cornelius praying for? For the salvation of the Gentiles. 
Oh, Lord, I am a holy man. I fear you. I know the God of the Jews is the one true God. I believe in the God of Israel, but I can never go in the temple as a Roman. I can't even get past the court of the Gentiles. I can never see you. I can never worship you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, Lord, that the salvation of the Gentiles could come to me and my household. Salvation for me and my family, that we could enter into this new covenant of your blood. I believe. I've heard these sermons. I believe what they're saying. Oh, but I can never because I'm a Roman. I'm a central. I can never enter. Oh, Lord. Hmm. Your prayer has been heard, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard, Cornelius. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon called Peter. He's lodging with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the seaside. And the angel spoke to him and left, and he called two slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks who served him. And after telling him everything, he sent them to Joppa. Three male witnesses. Joppa is 30 miles from Caesarea. It's a port city. If you recall in the Old Testament, when Jonah was to go to Nineveh, he ran off to Joppa and jumped on a boat up the port town and went to Tarshish. I'm not doing that. And if you remember, the temple was built with beautiful cypress trees from Lebanon that had to be brought to Joppa, and then from Joppa they could be transported by land to Jerusalem. Now, I want to take you back because near Joppa are Lida and Sharon, my favorite city in the whole Bible. <laughs> so I don't think we can't skip that story. But in, this is where Peter is. Peter's in Lida and Sharon, and he has just healed Aeneas, who had been paralyzed for eight years, if you recall from last week. But also in Joppa, Peter had just been resurrecting the dead. Wow, we didn't even cover that last week. They skipped over that one. That's a resurrection. That's as big as it gets for miracles. And this is at the church, St. Peter's in Joppa, the resurrection of Tabitha or Dorcas. There was in Joppa a disciple whose name is Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. In both languages, that means gazelle. Dorcas the gazelle. She was devoted to good works and acts of love and charity. She was a seamstress, and she would sew garments for people. And she became ill and died, and they washed her body. The widows, her other women friends, washed her body. They knew she was dead. When you wash someone's dead body, you know they're dead. They laid her in a room upstairs. And since Lida was near Joppa, the disciples heard that Peter was there. They sent for him with the request, please come without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. They arrived, and they took him up to the room upstairs. The room upstairs, the upper room. The upper room is a place of resurrection. And all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing their tunics. Look what she made me. Oh, she made this one. Remember when she gave me the, oh, remember when she made this one? They loved Dorcas. They showed him all the clothing she had ever made for them. And Peter put them all outside. He knelt down. He prayed. He turned to the body, and he said, Tabitha, get up. And when she opened her eyes, seeing Peter, she sat up. This dead woman sits up. And he gave her his hand, and he helped her up. Then calling the saints and the widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout all of Joppa, and many believed the Lord. What miracle does that remind you of that Jesus did? Where's the recapitulation here? <laughs> Resurrection miracles in the Bible. We'll look first at the Old Testament. There's not very many resurrections. That's as big as it gets, you guys. Elijah resurrected the Zeropath sons. The widow from Zeropath resurrected her son. Elisha resurrected the Shumanite woman's son. Remember, he lied, laid on him and sneezed seven times. The child opens his eyes. And another man that was dead and thrown onto the bones of Elisha came back to life just by touching his bones. That's an apologetic for relics, touching the relics of a holy person. In the New Testament... Resurrection. Jesus raised the widow of Nain's son, only in Luke's gospel. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And there were some resurrections when he died on the cross and was resurrected. The tombs cracked open and bodies were flying around and the saints would fall asleep. After the resurrection, they came out of the tombs and they entered the holy city. These resurrected bodies. And then Jesus himself in every single gospel records that the biggest miracle of all times, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But there's only one woman that Jesus raises from the dead. And the synoptics all had it. And it's Talithakum. It's little girl, get up. He goes in with Peter, James, and John, takes her by the hand and says, little girl, get up. Talitha actually means maiden. 
It's one letter off of Tabitha. Peter pulled them outside, knelt down, prayed. Peter was in on that miracle with Jairus' daughter. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Maiden, I say to you, arise. Just like Jesus had done. It's that recapitulation of the life of Christ in the new mystical body of Christ in the name of Jesus Christ. So we're at St. Peter's Church in Joppa. There's actually a church there now. And the altar piece is the tent, the sheet coming down, Peter's vision. Here's a close-up of it. And here's Simon the Tanner's house. Meanwhile, Peter was staying in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon a Tanner. Simon the Tanner. And tanning was a really dirty business. It's only this time in the Bible that we hear about it, but they would take dead animal hides, soak them in lye and, and lime, and um, they would even put animal dung on them to help separate the hair and the, from the leather. And then it was, a, it was a very smelly process, a very dirty process, a lot of unclean animals. This wouldn't be a good Jewish occupation <laughs> with all the laws. Because in Leviticus 5.2 it said, if a person touches anything ceremonially unclean, whether the carcass of unclean wild animals or unclean livestock or unclean creatures that move around on the ground, even though he's unaware of it, he's become unclean and guilty. Very stringent laws about this. So at noon the next day, high noon, they were approaching on their journey, approaching the city, and Peter went up to the roof to pray, and he was hungry, and he wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance, and he saw the heaven open, something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners, the four ordinals, north, south, east, west. This is something universal for all. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Now remember, if you touch anything ceremonially unclean, Peter knew this rule. He heard a voice say, get up, Peter, kill and eat, eat eat these unclean animals. But Peter said, oh, no, 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 by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, you must not call profane, Peter. What, what does this mean? It happened again a third time, three times, the divine number. And suddenly, it was taken back up into heaven. Now, this greatly puzzled Peter. He didn't know what to make of the vision. And suddenly, the men appear that Cornelius had sent, and they're asking for Simon's house. They're standing at the gate. They call out and ask whether Simon, called Peter, is staying there. And while Peter was still thinking about this vision, the Spirit of the Lord said to him, Look, three men are searching for you. Three, the divine number, the same three number that appeared to Abraham at the tent of Mamre, now get up, go down, go with them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you're looking for. What is it, the reason you're coming? And they answered Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken above by the whole Jewish nation, has directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear what you have to say, Peter. So Peter invited them in and gave them lodging, and the next day they got up and he went with them. Some of the believers from Joppa accompanied them. They followed the following day. They came to Caesarea, the 30-mile walk. Cornelius was expecting them. They had, he had called together relatives and friends, and the minute Peter walks in, Cornelius meets him, falls on his feet, worships him. But Peter made him get up, saying, Stand up, I'm only a mortal. Immediately, he's not going to take the glory that is the Lord's, as Herod did. And as he walked with him, he went in. He found that many had assembled. And he said to them, you yourselves know it's unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. He's being docile to the Holy Spirit. Now may I ask why you have sent for me? And Cornelius replied, four days ago at this very hour, at the three o'clock hour, I was praying in my house when suddenly a man in dazzling clothes stood before me. 
And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send, therefore, to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He's staying at the home of Simon the Tanner by the sea. How could he have known this? How could he have possibly known this stuff? They didn't have cell phones. <laughs> and therefore, I sent for you immediately. And you have been kind enough to come. So now all of us are here in the presence of God to listen to all the Lord has commanded you, Peter, to say. So Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does right, what is right and acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and dynamis power, how he went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil. Oppressed by the devil, the father of lies that has wounded mankind, for God was with him. This is the kerygma. Peter is preaching the gospel of the risen Christ. We are all witnesses. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him up on the third day. He allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, who ate with him and drank with him after he rose from the dead. I saw it with my own eyes. He commanded us to preach to the people, to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes. Did you catch that? You got to believe. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on these Gentiles, even on the Gentiles, on these dirty Gentiles. For they heard him speaking in tongues and extolling God. The Gentiles are speaking in tongues and they haven't even been baptized yet. So this is not Peter's doing. This is a bigger guy. This is God making it happen first, pouring his Holy Spirit out on them. They start rejoicing, speaking in tongues, glorifying God, extolling his name. They have the Holy Spirit and they haven't even baptized yet. So no one can say Peter did this. God did this. This was God's plan all along for a universal covenant for all, even the Gentiles. They heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And Peter said, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just like we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How can Peter order that? Because he's the rock. Jesus Christ prayed all night, Lord God, who shall I choose? Peter's the first one to confess, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And Jesus said, Peter, flesh and blood didn't tell you that. That comes straight from my father. My father told you that. Peter, you're rock. On this rock, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Peter, you're the rock. My father has chosen you. My father gave authority to me. I give it to you. So Peter ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. He can loose and bind. What you loose is loose. What you bind is bound. Peter has the authority from Jesus Christ to order, to lead. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he has the keys to the kingdom. <clears throat> Isaiah twenty two twenty two tells us about when the owner leaves, when the master leaves, he gives the keys to the LBAT, to the right-hand man. Peter's the right-hand man. Jesus Christ has left. He's gone back to the Father, but he gave the keys of the kingdom on earth, the church, to St. Peter. He answered your prayers, Cornelius. Your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Lord, is there any way that I could be baptized and filled with your Holy Spirit that me and my whole household could enter into your family? Yes, your prayers have been heard. That's coming. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. 
was a clear sign from God that the Gentiles were meant to come into the new covenant kingdom. God is all in. Cornelius is all in. God is up the ante. God supersized the ante for us. God's all in. And he wants us all in. Are you all in? Because he has baptized you in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives you the power you need to not live by the flesh, but to live by the Spirit, to walk with the Spirit, to reorder your passions, to serve God, and tell others of his saving power if they believe. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord, I, I feel such a strong sense that now the burden of proof is on us. Now we, the Gentiles, are to make the Jews jealous to make all other people who don't believe in you jealous by the love we have for one another, by the spirit of love that flows through us. We're supposed to make them jealous for you, that they want you, that they want to come back, that they want to come in, that they want to be all into this universal covenant. Lord, help us do that. Help us love. Help us love better. Help us not be judgmental, but help us speak the truth in love to glorify your Father so that all souls may come in and give us a zest for soul, a, a zeal for souls, Lord God. Light a fire in us. Oh, how I've come to bring fire on the earth. And oh, how I wish it were already kindled. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.